Everyone is looking for answers. Answers to both the common and the complicated matters of life. Thankfully, the real answers to all of life's questions are found in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible is the key that unlocks these answers, providing real solutions for this life and the life to come. As you join us today, you'll discover real answers to life's most pressing questions. And you, along with us, can rejoice in the Lord. Okay, let me ask you a question. I know that sometimes when you ask these questions, you know, somewhat of a murmur goes through the audience, but don't, don't say anything. I just want you to think, are you better or worse? Are you a better sinner or a worse sinner than the person, uh, you know, that you're seated next to? Now, don't answer it out loud. Don't even give body language like, mm, 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 mm. You know, when you stop to think about the question, it really doesn't matter. The, the point is not, are you a, and that's almost a contradiction of terms when you say better sinner. I don't know exactly what we're trying to say with that, but are you a greater sinner than the person, you know, to whom you are seated next? It's really not the question. I, I'm not saying that, that more sin or less sin doesn't have consequence in different fashions, but it's all sin in the sight of God. For example, you may not go to prison for stealing a towel in a hotel room or for, you know, playing somewhat with your tax return. You, you, you may be treated differently regarding those things than if you rob the bank down the street or if you drive off the lot in a new Corvette that doesn't belong to you. But I am saying that that really is not the point. The point is whether we have offended in some small way or some great way, regardless of the way, have we offended? The scriptural truth is that if you have offended in one point, you have offended the whole. It's kind of like a child who would, like a, I don't know, let's say I'm eight years old and and I got a new BB gun for Christmas and I'm excited about the BB gun, and my dad told me where I could shoot it, and, and so I'm in the backyard, and we have a little target set up, and, and I'm having fun. I'm, I'm playing with my BB gun, and, and all of a sudden, there are some blackbirds that are begging for my attention. And so I'm trying to, you know, poof, 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 poof. And, and I just was paying so much attention to the blackbird that I forgot about the neighbor's picture window, and I just put a hole in the neighbor's window. And it's, it's just this, it doesn't shatter the glass, I just put a hole in the window. Now, I'm a boy of upstanding character, and, and I am a guy of integrity, so I walk next door to the neighbor's house. I knock on the door. The neighbor comes to the door, and I say, Sir, I, I am feeling very badly about this. I was playing with my BB gun, and I shot a hole in your window. I am here to pay for the hole in your window. A dollar should cover the hole. (laughs) Thank you, sir. (laughs) Okay, Okay, well, the the sir, my neighbor, is going to say, son, come here a minute. The, The dollar might be what you would say is to cover the hole in the window, but you have to cover the whole window. So while I may have just put a, a BB gun, a BB size hole in the window, I'm responsible for the whole thing. So the, the challenge of me considering how good or bad I am measured against the law, the point of that is simply to condemn me as a sinner. Not a better sinner or a worse sinner, just the fact that I am a sinner. To be sure, most of us have shattered the glass completely. No matter what we've done, big or what we consider small, we all stand guilty before God. Now remember, the book of Galatians is going to keep bringing us back to the reality of the purpose of the law. I mean, over and over, 32 times in this brief letter that Paul sends to the churches of Galatia, 32 times he brings up the the word law, law, 
law. The title of my message today is what the law cannot do. There, there certainly is a purpose for the law, but, but we have to understand that there are some things that the Apostle Paul clearly says, okay, it does do this, but there are some things that you cannot ask the law to accomplish. And by the way, while we're at it, let's just, for, for sake of the fact that we all want to be on the same page with this, there shouldn't be any wonder, any confusion about what is it that we're talking about when we talk about the law? Because in all frankness, there are two aspects to the law that we need to include in this discussion. One part of the law is fairly easily understood, and that's what we would call the moral law. The moral law. That's the Decalogue, the the Ten, the Commandments. When God gave those, he was just giving some indication to his nature and his character. Other than keep the Sabbath, you'll see every other commandment repeated in the New Testament and reinforced by Jesus Christ. The commandments are the standard by which we are judged, and they stem again from the nature and the character of God. So if we concluded that the commandments were no longer valid... By that, the law, the Ten Commandments. If we we are trying to say, well, the law, it just doesn't matter anymore. Well, then are you saying it's okay to commit adultery? Are we saying it's okay? Listen, I'm not under the law anymore, so it's okay to lie. Uh, It's okay to take the high holy name of the Almighty and use it in in a common the common vernacular of some slang or curse word, or n- not even, I, I wouldn't say, oh my, and insert the name of God, but we might feel comfortable by just throwing it out there without thought, by saying, well, God help me as I go to, and we've just taken God's name and, and used it without thought or without reverence. Is it okay to do that today? See, if we want to conclude that it's still not okay today, even though we're under grace, then we do understand that the law serves as as a standard for us so that even today we can know there are some things that are true for all people, for all places, and for all times. They're the things that are connected to the nature and character of God. How often does God change? Oh, he's the one who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So regarding the the moral law, it's still intact. But I will also submit there are still some things that that moral law cannot do. Then there's also the ceremonial law. Paul references both the moral and the ceremonial law throughout the book of Galatians. But what he's helping us understand regarding the ceremonial law is there are things that serve their purpose. They were a picture. They're pointing us to the Messiah. They're pointing us to God. They're pointing us to the the substitutionary act of Jesus. They're, they're, they're proclaiming what Messiah would do, but they serve their purpose and they're they're no longer intact. Set them aside. Hey, if you want to hold on to some ceremonial law to continue picturing what Jesus Christ has already accomplished, okay, that's fine, but don't make someone else do it. If you want to continue to look to some ceremonial law and say, hey, this this is so significant to me that it's meaningful in my worship to God, well, go ahead, but don't think that by holding on to the ceremony of the law that you have gained any iota of favor in securing your standing with God. So Paul's trying to say, set it aside. This is what's taking the center stage in the book of Galatians. What they were doing is they're holding on to rules and regulations that govern behavior. These included things like sacrifices, offerings, special feast days, celebrations, the temple, the tabernacle, worship, priests, the rite or the passage of circumcision, the ceremonial cleanliness. They were primarily those things that were either given by God as pictures of spiritual truths or added by men in an attempt to protect the moral laws. Man cannot be saved by either moral or ceremonial law. We certainly can't keep the moral law to perfection, and the ceremonial laws are only given as pictures. 
So what do we do with that? Well, what we do is we just recognize what's the purpose of the law. What can't the law do? With that in mind, look in your Bible at Galatians chapter 2. Let's see again what the apostle says. Galatians 2, verse number 18. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Okay, First thing today is this. The law should neither be resurrected or restored. Let's begin there as we look at this passage. The law, what should we do with it? Well, the law should neither be resurrected nor restored. One of the things that we addressed recently was the confrontation that the Apostle Paul had with what were were called the pillars of the church. Do you remember who those pillars were? Really important people. The pillars were the Apostle Peter. Wow, what a, what a guy. Um, uh, the Apostle John. Again, very significant figure. And Pastor James, the brother of Jesus. Now, it, it comes to a, a climax ahead. It comes to it, its pinnacle in a conversation that Paul references that he had directly with the Apostle Peter. And that confrontation was, why in the world would I go back again to the very thing from which we were freed? To summarize the argument, if a person is going to rebuild something that he once tore down, we could assume that he made a mistake in tearing it down in the first place. The word destroyed there, it's very interesting. Look at it. Do you see it in your Bible? For if I build again the things which I destroyed, sometimes we might think that that word means To completely obliterate, but here's what it means. It's the word that was used. The Greek word would have been used in in the common uh, vernacular. It it would be used like this. Like I'm on a trip, and I'm carrying this, I'm on a journey, and I've got this heavy burden strapped onto me, or maybe onto my animal. Maybe I I, I got a donkey, and and I've got all this stuff strapped onto him, and it's a heavy burden. And so we're traveling, and and I've got it, and I'm carrying it, and oh, man, I can't wait for the time when that burdensome load is lifted from me. The word really means to, like, cut the strap, release it from, you know, holding on to, let it go. So now I finally get to my destination, and I can cut those straps off, or I can release the burden from the animal. Ultimately, We are not to return to the law because while it does have an extremely important purpose, it can only bring separation. The law cannot bring restoration. The law is serving its purpose. Okay, don't don't resurrect it. Don't, Don't put it back in a place. But the law is serving a purpose. What purpose is that? Oh, wow, it shows me what I'm separated from. But the law can never do the work of resurrection, of redemption, of restoration. Remember, as it pertains to God's moral law, it's still intact. So while the law should neither be resurrected or restored, we do see some value. And our next point says it like this. First of all, the law should neither be resurrected or restored. Second, the law remains a standard, not a system. The law remains a standard, not a system. I can't use the law as my system for getting to God. I can only use it as my standard showing my position with God, and that is separate. In his commentary, John Phillips said this, The law still exists as a standard, but it is fulfilled in another law, the law of love. Love lifts all human behavior to such high ground that it is scarcely necessary even to cite the law as a standard. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying, hey, listen, there's a greater law. That's the law of love. It actually is a a more demanding law, if you will. Like, wow, the standard of the law of love is higher than the standard of thou shalt not. He says, if you understand the law of love, you scarcely need the law that is left from the commands. Notice how Paul is about to write about the higher law that actually supersedes the commandments or the standard, if you will. Hey, if you want to look at this with me, I'm going to look at Romans chapter 13. You may want to turn your Bible and look at this passage because it's wonderfully connected to how we view these standards, the law. 
owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. The Jews saw the law as both their standard. Okay, we understand, hey, that's bad, that's good, that's right, that's wrong. They understood the law as their standard, but they also wanted to look to the law as their system. The way that they can actually find favor or acceptance with God. And by the way, they looked at themselves as supremely advantaged over their, their counterpart, the Gentiles. Well, well, we have the law. You have nothing. We, we have something. You don't have anything. In fact, the Jews, they had the law. They had the prophets. They had the covenants. They had the promises. They had the signs. They even had the Messiah. Hey, listen, you have no part with us. You Gentiles, you don't have any part with us. We, we have the standard and they believed we have the system by which we can have favor with God. But what did Jesus do that actually levels the playing field? What Jesus did is he said, no, 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 no. Both Jew and Gentile alike all are going to come to God exclusively one way. And any who want to, any. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what race. It doesn't matter what heritage. It doesn't matter what culture. It doesn't matter what age. It just doesn't matter. All who are thirsty can drink. If you desire, you come. That's the message that Jesus gives. We all come to God one way, not through a system which could never save anyway. Even the system was only intended to point a person to the one who would come to save. Paul's not saying that there's no advantage to growing up a Jew. After all, they could see the reality of Messiah through all of the systems that were put in place. He's just saying that both Jew and Gentile would come to God the same way through Jesus Christ. So, the law should neither be resurrected or restored. It remains a standard, not a system. And because it's only a standard, we come to the, the final point of this message. And that is this. The law can neither save nor sanctify. That's very important. And I want you to think through what we just said. We know that the law can't save. But it is interesting that oftentimes we start to, in our mind, think, well, at least I can be, if I, if I am a keeper of the law, at least I can be a better person. Whose job is it to save you? His name is what? Jesus Christ. Whose job is it to sanctify you? The same one who does the work of saving is the one who wants to do the ongoing work of sanctifying. So we get to this, this last point, the law can neither save or sanctify. Look again in your Bible at Romans chapter 8. Are you still hanging out in Romans? Romans 13, we were there a moment ago. Romans chapter 8. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse number 2, or beginning in verse number 2. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 2. Look what the Bible says here. For the law, oh, there's that word again. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit 
That passage is loaded with truth for our study in the book of Galatians. The law was never intended to save. It doesn't have the power even to truly sanctify. It simply shows us that we need someone to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. What we're saying by this is that the law serves as a diagnostic, not a cure. It tells us that there's a problem, but it doesn't give any help to resolve it. Okay, how many of you have ever had this happen? So you're, um, you're in your car and you're driving along and you notice that it starts to run a little rough. So you're getting some, you know, a little clanky noise and you're driving in your car and it's making some noise. And, you know, when it happens, we usually try to put it in the back of our mind like, ah, oh, that'll probably go away, you know. And, um, you know, it's just clunk, 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 clunk. And, and, uh, and then, you know, it's just running rough and you come up to the stop sign, the stop light, and, and you're sitting there and it dies, okay? So now your car is dying and, and you're, you know, and it starts up and you're driving again. Okay, so that's going on for a while. And then all of a sudden, the dreaded check engine light comes on. How many of you have ever driven with your check engine light on for more than a year? It's just us in here. How many of you have ever done that before? There's a lot of hands in this room. Nobody does this, do you? You don't do this. You're driving, your car's running rough, and it's, you know, oh, good. Ah, oh, my check engine light finally came on. Now everything's just fine. Do you do that? Well, of course not. Do you know what it's doing? It's telling you what you probably already knew. There is a problem. You probably knew a long time before your, your check engine light came on that there was a problem. But it came on and it kind of officially said, hey, Houston, okay, we have a problem. Well, well do you know what the law does? The law formalizes what you already knew, and that is I'm separate from God. The law is not here to now resolve it. This is not what we get to do. Oh, good. God formalized the law. I'll just keep that and then I'll be okay with God. Do you know, sometimes as, as Bible-believing Christians, those who know it is salvation through none other than Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross was absolutely sufficient. He became my, it's a wonderful word, propitiation, the satisfaction he satisfied the just demands of a holy God. And yet isn't it interesting that sometimes even we as Christians try to layer our salvation with other add-ons to try to find some additional standing with God. And God's saying, no, there's, there's no additional. You, you can't add or layer anything on. In fact, you, you can't add one tiny bit to what Christ has exclusively and completely paid for. So, so the law, it's not that, well, I'm just going to keep the law and now I'll be okay. You can't keep the law and that's the very point of God formalizing the law to show you what you already knew in your heart, I can't do this. I can't do it. I, I've tried. I, I made some attempts. In fact, even in our Christian life, sometimes we fall into the, the same way of thinking. Like, I, I just have to try harder. Try harder for salvation. Try harder for sanctification. The one who saved you did it completely. And do you know what he also wants to do? He wants to do the work in us of making us look like him. What the law does is what it's always done. It tells us there's a problem. It just doesn't solve the problem or, or whatever it is that is wrong. It doesn't make the law bad. It just reveals to us what we are. Romans 7, 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Do you know what it does? It just tells us what we know. Now I know. Okay, okay. It's formal. I've sinned. Let's ask this important question here. If the law can't save me, it can't sanctify me, what can it do? It can only condemn me and bring me to death. Now, if we ended this message at that point, it'd be a little bit frustrating. It's like, wow, that's it? 
really, that's, that's the only thing that the law can do. It just condemns me. It brings me to death. In scripture, in fact, in life, what does death always mean? You know the answer to this. What does death always mean? It always means separation. That's what it means. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, death, and by that, separation. Oh, they began to die at that moment physically. Their body began a process of death, but they experienced a far more significant death, and that is separation from God. Death always means separation, and the law ministered to us separation. That's what the law does. But, but Paul doesn't end this thought at separation. He goes beyond that and he helps us understand something far more beautiful. Remember, the wage of sin is death. By that we mean the wage of sin is separation from God. In one sense, Paul is saying this. The law brought death, and then Paul says, great, I'll take that. Are you with me? The apostle Paul actually says, okay, if the law came and brought death, he said, then sign me up. He, he says, okay, I will die. I am actually crucified with Christ. Do you know the only way for you to be risen with Christ is for you to die with Christ. And Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Did you notice in Romans, the Bible talks about the law being fulfilled in you. Who did that? Jesus Christ. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying, if the law brings death, great, sign me up. I have to die before I can live. And you know that's true for any person in here. There's no person who can be alive with Jesus Christ who has not first identified with his death. I was 17 years old. 17, March 20th, 1982. And I realized my sin has separated me from the holiness of God. And there is nothing I can do about it. And so I very simply, humbly, in a service not so different than this, I said, sign me up. I'll take that death. I'll identify what Christ did, I want in. His death was for me, okay, I'll accept that. I do have the ability to reject it. The greatest gift I've ever been given. I did have an opportunity to say yay or nay, but, but mine was yay and yay. And so I accepted that gift. I identified with his death his separation, the payment. I identified with his burial. Do you know the way I identified publicly with his burial was through water baptism. I wasn't saved by it, but I identified with it. I wanted everybody to know. I am identifying with Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, that, that happened to me. And, and now, because I, I identified with his death, it, when he died, it's like I died. <laughs> when he was buried, it's like I was buried. And when he arose, it's just like I arose. What happened to him happened to me. The law could only bring me so far, but Jesus Christ took me the rest of the way. Do you know what the law did? We're not going to rob from the future of Galatians, but the law was my schoolmaster. It was my teacher, and it had a long rod, and it got my attention. It was the schoolmaster that brought me to Jesus Christ. But in Jesus Christ, the law can no longer condemn me. Hey, hey, the, the law can no longer condemn me. Not, not in my previous life before I knew Christ and not in my life now that I know Christ. Because that judgment, all of it, has already been paid. L let's close with this. Years ago in the Midwest, when, when, when farms were large and prairies were vast, there was a, a man that lived out in this prairie area with his family and he had vast fields and, and the time of harvest was 
approaching rapidly. Back in that day, oftentimes there were winds and storms and such that would whip through of great consequence, but this was a different kind of storm. As the man was outside, he looked well off into the distance and he could see smoke that was approaching rapidly. He knew there was no opportunity for he or his family to escape the fire that would soon overtake them. The man quickly did something that confounded his family, quite frankly. He ran into the house, grabbed brands of fire from the fireplace, and began to go out and run through his own fields, lighting them on fire. Quickly, the wind caught the flame, and and that flame spread, and his own fields were burned. And then he grabbed his family, loaded up his, his little bit of belonging rapidly, and pulled them out into the middle of that smoldering field. And then you know what happened next. The fire that was very quickly approaching came and stopped at the edge of that which had already been burned. And it made its way around the family, around the space that was burned, and it continued on its march and and its, its feeding its hungry, fiery appetite. The family was safe because they stood on ground that had already been burned. Do you know the only place of safety that you have is to stand on ground that has already, so to speak, been burned? His name is Jesus Christ. He bore the full brunt of God's wrath. There's nothing left for you to pay. The law can't do that for you. But Jesus Christ can. And if you have never come to Jesus Christ, who bore in his body your sin on the tree, then I'm telling you, you have avoided the greatest gift ever given, and you run in danger of fire that will consume you. There are only two options for eternity. One is heaven. That was bought and paid for by Jesus Christ. The other is hell, and you'll pay for that yourself. If you've never trusted Christ, the invitation is for you to come to him today, the one who bore God's wrath, your judgment in his body on the tree. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's Word. Messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus. This is Rejoice in the Lord.